Hello. And welcome back to Real Damn Studio. Get my little clipboard here. Shows here we have a uh, Real Damn Studio number nine. Uh, weight check came out pretty good. We'll see that at the end. But I need to explain to you um, how these Real Damn Studios work. What they are for me, besides reason to check my weight and keep striving down, is also to try to open up myself a little bit more and who I am to, uh, well, some is my family, my kids, and my grandchildren also live out of the country. I can't travel much anymore, so chances are I won't be seeing them much. But through this, they can have a chance to see me and get to know me. Now, on this one, Real Damn Studio, my idea what I was going to talk about. And see, I try to share something, either a weight loss thing or something. I try to go from physical things to mental. To kind of keep a balance going. Mental one was to uh, address an issue I was going to put down. First, I put down the episode and then I put down an empty space until I come up with what I want to put in there and I try to stick to that order I came up with wanting to talk about an issue where in my family very few people ever went to college um, I was one of them yet when it comes down to it by most people's standards nothing came of it um, I do believe in education, but I'm kind of an example of why not to do it, and that's not was the intention. So I wanted to deal with that issue here. But as I started writing it up, I started getting into a rant. And if you see my other things, my old man rants, this gave me an issue where I would write down what I was trying to keep it not rant. I want to be real damn studio which is more friendly more open um, I leave the ranting the angry as much as I can to that area it's important but I'd like to keep them separate but it was getting hard so I wrote it down uh, find it ranted again an issue that I've always had well now in this country we've kind of fixed the medical in my opinion, cut the legs out of the people, the profiteers. Uh, that's not what it should be about. And now we got to do the same with education. And again, we got to cut the legs out of the profiteers. Most of the schools are doing nothing but just handing out pieces of paper for classes you attend, or maybe not. You know, and you can't use them half the time in the real world. They used to be applicable. Not so much now. It's, it's, well, it's starting to come back a little bit, but that's got to keep going with improvement in education. Now, this can go on and on as a rant. And watch out for a rant on higher education. I will be doing that. But instead, I kind of had to write myself a press release, a statement of what I wanted to say and everything about it without getting too venomous about it at times. So usually we're just like direct talking here. I'm going to have to read from something here. And I'm going to try to throw up images or something to entertain you guys as you're listening to this. So, um, best way I can deal with it without going off. But I do want it to be understood to my children, my grand grandchildren, anything, anyone out there, or just anyone listening. This is my opinion on how I feel about this. And I feel strongly about it, in spite of what I experienced. So, keeping that in mind, are you ready? It's about to be story time. As for education, I have taken many classes in fine arts and later performing arts. Then a computer animation degree while almost completing a video and audio degree. I needed just two more semesters. I know that kind of jumps into it, but I already talked about the beginning part, so I just came in where it mattered. I never worked a day in my life as a professional computer animator. I was a freelance artist. But anyone who trades a napkin drawing for a cup of coffee is a professional artist. 
you were paid for art. Freelance artists don't even need that to be paid, or don't even need to be paid. I sold at a few galleries, never featured in one. Uh, in my later years, I get work, I had to leave everything from my education off my resume. My last job before my heart gave was at Sears. I had put on my application that I had worked at that store once before. I had, right out of high school. I got the same job I had straight out of school. The one I quit because I had great things to do. Same job, same department, same employee number. Ended up, nice little definition of my working life. My artistic goals fell short and never paid the bills while I fell back on my background training from my parents, banker and retail. Personally, I always felt that both were no more than legalized theft. It embarrassed me publicly to talk about it and I did not want to be judged by that. It was easy though. Any trained monkey can do it. And many do. Poorly trained ones, actually. Uh, a profession where I ne never worked for anyone who knew their own job better than I knew their job. End up training most of the new managers that I that worked for. Yet, I was always too valuable where I was. They say they just keep giving me raises until my hourly ended up higher than a new manager that shows up and suddenly he feels threatened and I am no longer needed. This would have crushed me if not for the fact that deep inside I always knew I wasn't doing it to play and I could have dominated their game. For me, real education began in high school when I started to send samples to comic book companies so I would be ready to enter the work field when I graduated. I thought two years would be enough. I'd actually spend drawing for years. So I didn't come in and do a dry, it's just learning their system and their styles. They would return with what they thought I needed to do to learn to get better. Maybe my mistake was I sent many samples and got many different answers. So I went after classes and covered these areas. Then I would set on a new set. And I did this every four months to six months sometimes with their returns and what I needed to learn. I went to many companies, DC, Marvel, uh, there was Eclipse, there was East, there were many different companies at the time actually, this is in the 80s. And then I would either find classes of that in school or use the libraries. I was a latchkey kid so I had time at home for my own studies. This is back when I was before I got to college and I had to find other ways to learn what I needed. Then I graduated. I actually went on to a few interviews, was told my copy was too much like this guy or that guy, not enough like this one. And you should really develop your own style. Take a couple years, took fine art courses at community college every day at least two hours a day in my art room or a closet for wherever I happen to live. If I missed a day I made up for it by extra hours the next time. Got it so I could complete two pages a day penciled and inked with lettering ready for printing. Sent them in. The response had to do with the writing on the sample, not the art. So now they said I need some drama classes to improve my scripting. So back to community college with performing art classes. Then later, goes out to my next samples, the questions and comments on the fashion style and choices of the people in the comics, as well as more story issues. I just wanted to draw on ink a comic, their stories, where someone else did that. I didn't want to have to create it. I just wanted to be the artist. But I couldn't get in or anything. And they just kept, you know, uh, then the big crash of the quality of the comic books came in the late 80s and early 90s. Wow. See another rant I'm working on, uh, on superheroes versus Hollywood. But to go on, um, I quit reading most of the comic books at that time. 
So they were no longer worth my time and now I had stories and art and nowhere to take it. Why was it so hard for people to show others their work? I didn't want them to buy it, I just wanted to have people see it. This is when computer animation came in for me. With it, I could create my own comics as cartoons. Actually, this time the cartoons and animated features were getting better than the comic books. So I would learn animation and work on these shows. Still, just wanted to create the art and stories were still too raw for me and want to share yet. I never wanted to be the boss. There I learned video as well as audio because from prior to 2000 there was less computer animation stuff to learn and they filled it with video and audio which was advantageous to me. I'm glad they did that. So now that I had the tools I wanted my stuff seen and I, and I learned of public access. They offered further education in how to make TV and that led me to learn and earn my awards. The current greatest validation of my education and my art. I wanted to learn how to do things for me to know and to do, not to sell. I learned what I wanted to learn. Education is the only true and fair way to judge everyone. If you feel you need to do so. But only if everyone had the same access to education, and everyone should. Then we will all be better informed, educated, never a bad thing. Controlling education by price limitations of class availability? Who has anything to gain by that, I say? Who? To me, it started when I, st when I started public access, and now here on YouTube. No money, just sitting here making noise. My noise will last my me. Maybe someone will need to hear what I had to say and it changed the world and then it's worth it. I never said the world had to change for the better. Just that I had to cause a change. Now, I sit here and pump after and after hour and hour of work onto the airwaves, cable, internet. Look at it or don't. At this point, I'm beyond your judgment. Some worry that they are going to steal my work, but I'll know and they will know. And if they had to steal it from me, there's literally no chance they can do a better job with it than I would have done. And possibly for nothing or very simple, just some acknowledgement. In the end, it's their loss, not mine. Should have bought my art when it was in a gallery. Then I might have been nicer about it all. Thank you, and have a good evening. I've gone from Boy Scout to D Malay to Solo Wiccan to OTO Initiate to Pagan Priest to Atheist. All in a search for more in life. In the history of the natural world to the supernatural. 
I found many weird things. But just because I don't know what it is doesn't make it supernatural. While the true heart of science is to always question even yourself. In the end, I have become an objective atheist. I am an atheist, but I want there to be more. Welcome to Damn Weird, and in this, I'm going to attempt to organize my collective thoughts on uh, various unusual events and things and people that have occurred, and things I've studied, just a way to organize them here onto YouTube for me. Now we're going to start with some of the easier things, simply because we need kind of a foundation for our studies, for something to look at. These are things that maybe shouldn't exist, but do. Solanodon. This is a being covered because this creature exists. That it is filled with unique abilities. So if this is a creature that does exist, some of the other cryptids we'll be covering later seem a little less bizarre. It was first discovered in 1861 by Wilhelm Peters. Only 32 had been caught. They were believed extinct till 1999, when, and later in 2003, when they were spotted. But this should not surprise anyone. These small creatures survived the dinosaurs and the meteorite that killed them off. They would survive. The Slanodon looks much like an oversized shrew. It weighs about 1.3 pounds, Head to body length is about 11 to 13 inches. It has brownish red fur on most of its body. With a paler underside, the tail, legs, snout, and ear tips are hairless. Forelegs are noticeably more developed than the hind legs, but all have strong claws useful for digging. The head is very big in relation to its body. With the long nose and tiny eyes and ears, the second lower incisors has a narrow groove. Selenodons derive from the Greek for grooved tooth, through which flows a venomous saliva secreted by a submaxillary gland, making the selenodon one of only a handful of venomous mammals. That's right, basically a mouse with venom. To go on though, both sexes are similar. They may have two litters of one to three young per year. Usually only two of the offspring survive because the female only has two teats which happen to be found near her buttocks. The young are weaned after 75 days, but may sometimes remain with the parents while subsequent litters are born and raised, so up to eight animals may share the same burrows. Selenodons may fight each other on first meeting, but eventually they establish a dominance relationship and live together in captivity in relative harmony. The Selenodon has glands in the armpits and in the groin, which are said to give off a goat-like smell. I guess if you're a mouse, a goat is a good disguise. It really defends itself against one of its own kind and is apparently not immune to its own venom since animals have been seen to die after fighting and sustaining minor wounds. It may also attack other animals savagely. A captive Selenodon was reported to have attacked a young chicken and torn it to pieces with its strong claws before eating it. In the moments of excitement, it may grunt like a pig or give bird-like cries, but when pursued, it stays motionless and hides its head, making it easy to capture. Okay, now, to remind you, this is one foot long and less than one and a half pounds of mouse killing your chicken. Granted, it's a big mouse. It's like the size of a toy poodle, but, you know, with short legs. The Slido was unknown to science for so long because it's nocturnal, a consequence of which it's highly developed sense of hearing and smell and touch. Just think, though, how many cryptids are reported as being nocturnal and we can't find. Also, they are not very numerous, so their influence on an ecosystem is practically nothing. During daylight hours, they stay in their burrows, trees, hollowed out logs, or caves, remaining hidden from view. When they do come out, they run on their toes with a stiff, ungainly waddle, following an erratic, almost zigzag course. Local people claim Selenodons never run in a straight line. When a Selenodon is alarmed and tries to move faster, it's very likely to trip. 
The Selenodons eat a wide variety of animals including anthropods, worms, snails, and small reptiles. They may also feed on roots, fruits, and foliage. Although one study found they refused all forms of vegetation. They probe the earth with their snouts and dig or rip open rotting logs with their claws. Selenodons in captivity have been seen to bathe often and to drink only while they're bathing. Now in the matters of conservation, the Selenodon was identified as one of the top 10 focal species in 2007 by the Edge Species Project. A collaborative conservation project funded by the Darwin Initiative was started in 2009 and is researching the species to conserve it. The species is fully protected by law. However, national parks in both Haiti and the Dominican Republic are threatened by deforestation and encroachment of, for farming and charcoal production. The U.S. Agency for International Development and the Nature Conservation are working with local non-governmental organizations to improve protection and implementing management plans for these parks. A recovery plan for the isolated Haitian population published in 1992 advocated comprehensive surveys, improved management of the Hikmakaya National Park educational campaigns, control of exotic mammals, and an excellent breeding program. Two conservational research and education programs funded by the Darwin Initiative have recently been established, focusing on Selenodons in both countries, building evidence and capacity to conserve Hispaniola's endemic land mammals, starting 2009, and building a future for Haiti's unique vertebrates starting in 2010. These collaborative projects present a partnership between the EDGE program, the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, BirdLife International, and Sociedad's Ornithologica de la Hispaniola. I'm sure I got that one wrong. The Dominican Republic National Zoo, Society Audubon Haiti, and in-country project partners. That's right. This is basically a 1.3, one foot long mouse with venom. Glands in the armpits and in the groin, which are said to give off goat-like smell. It has two teats, which are found near its buttocks. But sleep well. It's just a mouse. Thank you for listening. Magellan sails around the world. Moments in history. Magellan, an expatriated Portuguese, whose expedition was the first to circle the earth, sailed from Spain in 1519. He discovered the tortuous passage around the tip of South America and eventually came out on the waters first seen by Balboa. He named the ocean Pacific because of its gentle breezes. Reaching the Philippines after suffering great hardships, he died. Sebastian de Cano continued the voyage, eventually bringing it to Spain with great news that at last, east, had been reached by the sailing west.